Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we'll open the August 7th um, study session for the Littleton City Council. We have full attendance and um, we are also honored to have our guest this evening um, from Lakewood, Mayor Bob Murphy and City Manager Kathy Hutchins. Hutchinson. Hudson. Gotcha. So thank you so much for coming and we're um, really honored that you guys have taken the 30 mile trek from <laughs> across town to get here. But to um, give us some insights into some of the things that you've done um, economic development wise, certainly taking Villa Italia and doing what you've done there and then I know you were got some stuff going on with the Federal Center some challenges that you're working through and stuff would love to hear your story um, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you and then um, we will try to keep this I think we're planning to uh, start our regular meeting at 730 Correct. right so we'll run um, we could probably go to about 720 we want to make sure we have some time for questions and stuff too we'll do that okay yeah Succinct, right? We we may have a lot of questions though. Sure, we're we are curious a lot. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you. We'd like to start with a presentation um, showing you the history of Belmar, starting as Villa Italia, and Mayor Murphy's going to do that. We have a PowerPoint presentation. And then Kathy will uh, talk about the Fed Center and some of the things that are going on here as well. Sure. Okay. Thank Right, we can't do a presentation without a PowerPoint in this day and age, so, so here we are. Well, thank you for the, for the invitation. It really is uh, an honor to be invited. We're very, very happy to be here. Uh, Belmar is a story, obviously, that we love to tell. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we were able to turn uh, a regional mall, which had outlived its natural life cycle, into a new urbanist downtown in a city that never really had a downtown. Um, and the story of how we did that is what I want to spend the next few minutes talking about. You know, uh, it, it's hard to imagine this, but in, in the old days, and I'm talking even back in the 1920s and 1930s, this part of Lakewood was sort of a weekend retreat for wealthy Denver families. And uh, in fact, Alameda Avenue was originally built as a sort of a boulevard to the, to the foothills for, uh, for weekend retreats. And that's why it's actually so wide. So Belmar is, it was the name of a mansion that was located just west of Wadsworth in what's now Belmar Park. And it was the mansion of uh, May Bonfi Stanton, uh, Denver Post heiress. And it was built in, in 1930. That's where, the, that's where the name Belmar comes from. It was really a grand, grand mansion. And for some reason, none of, none of us fully understand, it was a requirement of, the, of her estate that it be torn down as part of, the, uh, set part of the will. So in 1970, this beautiful, gorgeous building was unfortunately torn down. And that, again, is just, just west of Wadsworth, across from Villa. So Villa was built, um, Villa opened in 1966. And it was really quite, uh, quite a spectacular facility and quite a spectacular event. Um, Opening weekend, 725,000 people came from 36 states to witness what was then the largest indoor air-conditioned shopping mall between Chicago and Los Angeles. Think about that. Um, it was a little over 800,000 square feet at the time. And Villa was something, and this is important to remember as we go through the presentation, Villa was a great source of pride to the community, to the residents of Lakewood. It was a place where people got married. It was a place where people held their proms. It was a place, obviously, where seniors walked, as, as, uh, for, as, as happens in virtually any indoor mall. Um, towards the end of that life cycle, unfortunately, uh, we were saying they did everything at Villa except shop there. And that's, uh, that's when we, we knew we had to, uh, had to do something. So it was, it was built by Jerry Von Freilich, who, who he built malls really all, all over America, including Englewood, Boulder, Texas. And it was designed uh, after the Galleria in Milan, Italy, and thus the, the fountains and sort of that Tuscan architecture. 
1983, things were going so well that it was expanded from about 800,000 square feet to 1.4 million square feet. Second level was added to much of it. Uh, and it, it continued to perform largest, largest sales tax uh, producer uh, in the city of Lakewood. It peaked in about 1994 when it contributed about $3.1 million in sales tax to our coffers in Lakewood. That was a lot of money back then, a lot of money today. Um, and then the downturn was rapid. It was, it was fast. Um, as I always say, time and freeways passed Villa by. Um, there were new glittering malls, whether it's Cherry Creek, whether it's uh, Flatirons, whether it was Park Meadows and Villa, as happens with malls, particularly in first-tier suburbs like we all are, had, had outlived its life cycle. Um, stores became vacant. Sales went down. Uh, there was some soil and groundwater contamination. Um, I'm going to show you some of the, this is, this is the glory days. This is the, what it looked like from, from the air, obviously. It's part of the so-called Tuscan architecture. So this is what it started to look like. Empty storefronts, um, declining sales tax revenue, um, increasing crime, um, whether it's graffiti or whether it's uh, hooligans, to use an old word. Um, so we, we had this, this uh, sort of perfect storm of declining revenue and increased uh, uh, costs to, uh, to police it. So it was, it was not a good situation. And I'll just say we looked at a lot of options on Villa Italia. We looked at, uh, at, at turning a two-movie theater thing into a 16-movie theater thing. You, you run into uh, one of the things I learned during those days back in the 90s is that, uh, well, two things. Uh, one, one is that anchors control traditional malls, right? If you're, if you're Foley's, if you're Penny's, if you're Nordstrom's, whatever you are, you control the mall. You pay virtually nothing in, in a lease, and, and the, 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 the lease rates are paid by the smaller guys. So, um, and the second thing I learned was that when you talk about parking lots in malls, they build the cathedral for Easter Sunday, and Easter Sunday is the Christmas season. So anything that we were going to do to improve the mall that took away one parking space was vetoed by the anchors. We had, we had no chance to go kind of that traditional route of, of trying to make the mall better. And Bob, uh, kind of helping us understand some of the evolution, when you say we took a look. The uh, city. That's a, that's a very uh, royal we. The city. Is it the city staff that initiated some of this analysis? City, city staff, um, um, city council. As, as well as, uh, you know, the movie, the private sector, the movie theaters themselves. I mean, we had drawings, we had, you know, we, we were going to put in a 16 theater complex with a two le level parking garage, all that sort of thing. In retrospect, it's a good thing we didn't. Um, so everybody became concerned, the, the community became concerned about Villa, and the, the question was, what are we going to do about it? And, and we, we uh, Let's just put it this way, our phone wasn't exactly ringing. There were, there were not developers calling us, knocking on our door, uh, proposing to do anything dramatic with, with Villa. Uh, the city of Lakewood did not have urban renewal powers. Do you guys have urban renew renewal? Okay. So we did not. So in, uh, a campaign was launched in 1997. It was, uh, it was called the Save the Villa Campaign. Um, unfortunately, we, we were reminded of that later. Um, and the city voted, uh, voted in urban renewal powers in 1997. The other thing that they did, the other choice they had on that ballot was who, the makeup of the urban renewal authority. We call it a reinvestment authority. The voters had a choice to, to uh, appoint a separate board or to allow the existing city council to wear that second hat as urban renewal authority, and the voters chose, chose the latter option. So we sit also as the urban renewal authority. Um, lo and behold, our phone started ringing. How about that? Once, uh, once some of those tools were available, uh, people became interested. Um, early on, a relationship was, was formed, uh, an introduction was made uh, between our, our then city manager, Mike Rock, and uh, Mark Falcone from Continuum Partners. Um, they like to tell the story today that the original concept of Villa was drawn on a cocktail napkin at their first lunch. Um, they're both prone to hyperbole. I don't know if it's true or not. But uh, they, both, they, you know, they both had a lot of vision, and, and, and uh, they both were in agreement about trying to create this um, 
again, this new urbanist uh, uh, vertical development in the, in the suburbs. Well, vertical development means, means structured parking, and that means a whole lot of money. So we started the, the discussion, first of all, once, once the, the idea was hatched, we began talking to the community. And, and I know this is something that's a great concern to you. Um, you can't do this unless the stakeholders, the residents, are, are, and business owners are, are engaged. So uh, Mayor Steve Burkholder at the time, we're now talking about 2000, 2000 actually 1999 and 2000, formed, um, formed a committee, a villa committee. And uh, that committee spent, let me just back up, there was actually a separate committee in the late 90s called the Southwest Quadrant Committee, which was uh, the location of this. And then, uh, and then the Villa Committee. So the development principles were formed by the citizens. The citizens met in a facilitated manner for about 18 months, and they came up with seven, 17, I guess, development principles. And what we did, and I think we've all done this since then, um, the first thing we did with this, with this group, and please remember, Villa was an institution. The idea of changing it and tearing it down was absolutely um, horrific, frankly, to many of our residents. They could not imagine Lakewood without Villa Italia. So we put this group together. Um, we started out with what we call the camera exercise. We gave them all uh, little disposable cameras. We gave them three weeks during the summer. You know, you're traveling to Steamboat or Vancouver, wherever you're going in the summer. And we said, come back with pictures of what you like and pictures of what you don't like. Well, imagine what they came back with. What they liked was vertical, mixed-use development, brick. What they didn't like was seas of asphalt, Walmart parking lots, to a T, to every single citizen. So that kind of formed the foundation for the discussion of what a new urbanist downtown might look like. So over, that, over those many, many months, we created that, that citizen resident buy-in, and that allowed, allowed us to really launch uh, into the planning in a, in a serious manner. Um, you have to have a good partner. I mean, at the end of the day, you can, you can do everything right, but if you don't have a, a good visionary partner like, like Continuum Partners, um, somebody that's in it for the long haul, it's just, it's just not going to work as well. We all know that in the development community, there are different types of folks. There are folks that uh, are here for the short run, and there are folks that are here for the long run. In this case, Continuum is here for the long run. And uh, uh, we started a relationship with them. We started talking about various finance mechanisms. Again, if you're going to, first of all, you've got to tear out the old. This was a very complicated ownership structure. Villa Italia was, the ground was owned by Prudential, right? Uh, an insurance company, a, a, a teacher's retirement fund, I believe, in, in Prudential. And the improvements were owned by, I'm sorry, the ground was owned by Bonfi Stanton Foundation, and the improvements were owned by a teacher's re retirement fund. So, you know, it was, it was very difficult for us to do anything with. Um, we were able to, through the, through our, our relationships uh, with uh, many of those tenants, uh, we were able to slowly work our way out of a lot of those leases, um, except for one, um, the late great Foley's. I don't know if anybody's ever had the pleasure of working with Foley's. Uh, they play hardball. And uh, to this day, um, Dick's Sporting Goods store is the original Foley store. It was the last one. Uh, that, that building was never torn down. The rest of the, the, rest of the mall was. Um, we actually had to, that's the, only, that's the only lease we had to take to court under our urban renewal powers, and we, and we were victorious in that. Michael? Mayor, what was the low? So if the high point was $3.2 million in 94, what did it, you said it went down fast? It was down under a million and a half by 19, before 1999. I mean, it just okay. torpedoed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we went. Th we did go through an RFP process. Continuum was selected as as the master developer, and we started forming the num numerous entities that are required uh, to do a development of this level of complexity. Um, special districts, uh, financing, 
Um, we, we have complex arrangements, which Kathy knows more about than I do, but uh, in, in terms of uh, how streets are plowed. Now, if you think about it, has everybody been to Belmar? Okay. You don't, if it snows a lot, this is a pedestrian-oriented development, right? If it snows, you can't just push, push the snow onto the sidewalks and those beautiful sidewalks. You have to remove the snow. That is above and beyond the standards of city snow removal procedures. So we, we, we actually have an arrangement, payments. Um, they, they basically, what do we, we subsidize them for the normal cost of snow plowing, right? Right, right. So that's the kind of that's an example of the kind of minutia that we had to get into to, to make this work. From a broad perspective, the creation of this of this urban village again back to structured parking and, and, and vertical development. You got to tear out the old. Remember, there's ground contamination, and before you can build the build the new, that's very very expensive. So the the kind of deal we struck is, is really what you see often these days. Um, the cost of the initial improvements before the first store opened was $185 million to, do, uh, to tear out the old infrastructure, to build, uh, build the new grid street system, the vertical parking, which is very expensive. Um, no city has that kind of money. No city our size has that kind of money. Nor did we want to. We're, we're kind of a risk-adverse community. We're not. We, we weren't going to go out and float bonds, and hope um, and hope for the best. So the kind of deal we cut with continuing partners was, you and your bond, your bondholders, you put the money in up front. We pay you back over time via sales tax and and, uh, and property tax sharebacks. Part of that is what's called a public improvement fee, uh, a source of consternation and confusion continually you know to residents these to shoppers these days uh, the public and I don't know if we need to get in the deals of the financing but the public improvement fee at Belmar is 2.5 I think we share we kept the sales tax at 2 percent we share we, we have a 50 50 split on the sales tax um, and then they add a two and a half percent PIF and they we actually collect that for them for a nominal fee since we have the mechanism to, to do that. But then it all goes back to them uh, for repayment, along with the sales and property tax share back, for repayment of that $185 million investment that they made. The advantage to us is that, God forbid, should that development never have happened or, or it tanks tomorrow, not one nickel of Lakewood taxpayer money is, is at risk. The developer took all the risk. And that's why we think it was a very prudent and very conservative way to approach uh, this, this particular investment. We did the same thing, by the way, with Walmart at Colfax and Wadsworth. The same kind of principle. Walmart put in all the $24 million in drainage improvements and whatnot. They attached a little PIF, and uh, they get paid back for their investment. We didn't invest anything. Um, so I've been talking and not really going through the slides here. There's an example of the Tuscan architecture, J.C. Penney. Um, you know, it was, it was interesting. Uh, the, the, the tenants, the anchor tenants I spoke of earlier were, now think about this, uh, J.C. Penney, their headquarters in Chicago, made a decision to close that store while, while Villa was still open. Montgomery Wards, they went out of business. Um, Dillard's, which they chose, it was what I, I, I have an unfortunate uh, phrase I call it a dump store, but they they, they took all of the, the the clothing that was furthest on down the line and they stocked that villa store with it. And then the fourth one was Foley's. Foley's was really the only real store, only real store there. Um, so as we began construction in 2001, there is the Foley's building now, the Dave Cook's <laughs> building, the only thing left standing. Uh, part of that, frankly, was because uh, was because of the uh, the court case that was going on. And uh, they just continue and found a way to integrate it into the development. And it now, by the way, serves as a headquarters for the integer group up on the third floor. It's true mixed use. You've got the sporting goods retailer on the first two floors, and then the headquarters for integer, uh, a 400 employee marketing, marketing firm is on the third floor. So the grid pattern starts to take shape. We are looking, I'm guessing, east. Are we looking east? Yeah, we're looking east with Alameda on the left there. 
remind me to tell you about lessons learned here as we go through this. Lessons learned from continuum standpoint. So this is an interesting story. Um, there was, I, I don't know why this slide is in here. This is, this, is at the epicenter, this is at the epicenter of Belmar. And we actually had a little bit of consternation about how our community was going to react to a Victoria's Secret at, uh, at, the corner of their, at the main corner of their gleaming new downtown. And uh, fortunately, there was little, little or no reaction, but uh, um, there was some. We, got, we all got a few emails about it. Um, we've, we've fortunately all moved past that. How residential about that? It is. It's residential above. Uh, in that case, I'm trying to remember. I have to confess I've never been in Victoria's Secret, so I, can't, I don't know if that's a two-level store or not. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So yeah, there's uh, one to two levels. It's all it, it's classic retail on the ground floor, um, residential and or office on the on the top floor. Uh, what you have, if you've been out there, you have very narrow streets and very wide sidewalks. We wanted it to be pedestrian friendly. The streets are so narrow that people complain about it. We like that. They have to drive very very slowly. They have to get out of their cars. Um, one one quick side story. Uh, we had a lot of surface parking spaces and we had a lot of, of vertical parking spaces. I think at the end of the day we could park as many as 9,000 cars there. But what, what were we going to do about parking on the street? You know, we wanted street parking to be very convenient. We, didn't, we wanted people to be running and get their, their cup of coffee, run and do some quick shopping. Um, we did not want the employees to, to come at 7.30 in the morning and take all this, the 250 street parking spaces. Well, how do you do that in a, in a suburb that's never had a parking meter? We had a very long community conversation about paid parking. Um, to this day, it's still the only, I believe, the only paid parking in the city of Lakewood. And what we came up with was those blue kind of kiosks you now see everywhere. And even Cherry Creek uh, went to that a few years back, Cherry Creek North. And, you know, people barked about it at first, but it absolutely served its purpose. Uh, people can come in, they can pay a quarter for you know, 20 minutes, they can pay 75 cents for an hour, they can get their quick shopping done, and the employees do not hog, hog excuse me, the very important on-street parking spaces. So there, there's a look at the uh, classic, you could look at the mixed use. Those are uh, lofts, those are for sale lofts primarily above That's actually a stairway into one of the one of the many parking garages. So this this was interesting. Um, there are now uh, let me get the figures. In terms of residential units, there are, uh, there are 833 residential units. Of those, 38% um, are sales units. 62% are rental apartments. Uh, one of the, I don't know, I think we have a clear shot of this. Oh, oh let, let me just mention this. This is one of the parking, uh, the parking garages. And what they did was create um, artist studios. Instead of having a, just a concrete wall for a parking garage, they embedded, so to speak, seven or eight art, working artist studios in there and uh, uh, made the streetscape obviously a lot more interesting. The, then they retrofitted a 1.7 megawatt solar system with panels on top of the parking garages. That did not go in until several years after, after Belmar was open. So one of the things that, that from a, you know, we all, we all think a lot about housing in our communities, um, more and more, particularly in our older communities. How do we, as we get older, and I can say that, you know, empty nesters still living in the same house that I raised my kids in, how do I open up that house to help regenerate the community, um, uh, open it up for sale to a new young family? Well, part of that decision is based on whether or not I have a, a, a desirable place to live in my own community. So Belmar built a lot of these urban row homes, four-level four row homes. And we really had this vision of creating kind of a, um, a mini Lodo, right? Attracting the, 
younger, hipper um, folks with more, a lot of discretionary income. And to some extent, we succeeded. But the first thing that happened was a lot of us, empty nesters, bought these four-level row homes. It, it actually uh, it, it startled us a little bit. So much so that Belmar had to build more residential out of the chute than they originally planned. The demand was so great. Those folks are still living there. I mean, they're, they're folks in their mid-60s, mid-70s. They're going up and down the stairs. They're very, very active um, seniors, and they absolutely love living there. So that was a market trend that uh, we were not quite smart enough to predict, but it really worked out in our favor on, on a number of levels. So today, um, there's another parking garage with, with more, uh, more solar panels on the top. This is, this is sort of the central uh, uh, park, and those are directly kind of parallel with the park. Those are for sale units. The ones to the left are all rental units. And again, you can see the structured parking for those units in the background. All of them have structured parking available. This is one of the last ones, if you've been out there on the plaza where the skating rink is in the, in the wintertime. Um, the plaza lofts at, at Belmar Square, it's really the highest um, per square foot uh, for sale. In fact, some of them on the top floor uh, are million dollar units. And uh, they're very, very much in demand. Festivals. Um, Belmar has been very strategic about marketing their uh, marketing their community, our community, to people from the region. So whether it's Sundays, farmers markets, other festivals throughout the year. This, of course, is the Italian festival held on a Saturday and Sunday in September. A hundred thousand people come from over the, all over the Denver metro area to the Italian festival. It has already become uh, a tradition. Uh -huh. They do. You say they. A Belmar continuum. Yep, they do it. Now, obviously, we coordinate. We should probably talk about police protection too. I mean, they, they have they have their own private security. We also have a uh, kind of a Belmar unit of what half a dozen. Yes, we do. And that's the Okay. So it's 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 a comp complicated, interrelated public-private partnership on, on so many levels, whether it's snow plowing, whether it's uh, street cleaning, whether it's uh, police protection. They do a lot of it themselves. I mean, it really is sort of a, it is very much a private district, but uh, formed, you know, in complete cooperation with us at the city. Are the, I'm sorry, Mayor, are the streets public? They are public streets. So and then they have they have a district in essence a metro district for simple terminology that handles the events all of the management of the leases and right. ownership of the buildings right. and all of that. Okay. Yes. Yep. So we now have uh, 888,000 square feet of retail. It's 94 percent leased. Um, openings last year included the, the Target, which I think we have a picture here. So here's, here's uh, Christmas. Uh, they do a great job of decorating it for the holidays. This is the plaza, uh, Belmar Plaza. You saw the lofts kind of on the, the right side of the screen. This is the left side. That's Baker Street Pub. Some, some of us may identify it by the local watering holes. That's Baker Street. Um, <coughs> There's just some of the design. That's the Ohio Center for Broadcasting now. That used to be the Belmar, uh, the, the ballroom, the event center, which was great to have unless you were continuing partners and were subsidizing it to the tune of three, and quarter, three quarters of a million dollars a year. Um, so now it's, it's fully occupied by uh, uh, a hairdressing s uh, school and a broadcasting school, which is really great to have those young, those young folks uh, in, in and out of Belmar every day. They're, they go right from class to Baker Street. It's good, good stuff. There's the skating rink. Very, very popular in, during, during the winter. Just rent, there's a little Airstream trailer. You rent skates. Great family entertainment. Um, the urban design is just fantastic. This really is the look from standing at Whole Foods towards the theaters. It's a long promenade. Um, and that is the, the lofts. Um, that's the retail on the bottom and the Belmar lofts on the right. And you also walk past... Uh, they walk past the new Target, which you'll see in a second. Again, classic mixed use. 
So Target was one of the openings along with Best Buy and Nordstrom's Rack in 2011. This was really a, really a coup. So, so some people have asked the question of, you know, I thought, I thought Belmont, well, why are these chains? Why are these national sort of big box people there? Um, I thought it was going to be all boutique shops. And the answer is that you have to have the mix. You're not going to sustain yourself economically by having, um, you know, Joanne's Boutique. I hope there's no real Joanne's Boutique, but you know what I mean. Um, that look, People are going to come once a month to shop at Joanne's. They're going to come twice a week to shop at Target. So you've got to have you've got to have that balance. So we've got we've got Target, we've got Nordstrom's Rack, we've got Best Buy, we've got Whole Foods, which some of us are in virtually every day, and that brings the traffic in. And then we're, when they're done there, they go up and down the streets and shop at the at the smaller retail. It's that was a very conscious conscious strategy. Um, it took a little longer because of the economy than, than we hoped to get some of these guys in in here, but it's been very very successful since uh, these stores have opened. This is an urban target. A typical target is a 13-acre site or thereabouts with that classic sea of asphalt. This is a two-acre site, and the parking is underneath. So that's, that's, how you, uh, that's how you create kind of an urban target on a, on a suburban site. And uh, again, wildly, really wildly successful, um, not just the store itself, but in, in, in serving the goal of bringing folks in. Oops. I have a question. Yeah. On the target, <coughs> with the cost of underground parking, how, who, who paid for that? Who owns that building? And I'm just surprised that they thought that would be economically feasible with the cost of So you. Target actually owns that building and paid for the parking, so that's not a share of public okay. um, expense or investment. What else is interesting is the Target actually, the parking's on the main level, yeah. so you have to go up a level. So the shopping's on the second level. Right. So you have to go up an escalator or walk to walk mm -hmm. upstairs to get to the shopping area. Thank you. So uh, 888,000 square feet of retail. There's about 248,000 square feet of office, which has been 100% leased from day one. I mean, if we could build more office, we could we could fill it. People love working there, love working there. Just walk to lunch, walk and get your coffee, do some shopping on the way home, pick up dinner from Whole Foods. Um, we've got uh, parking decks. We've seen pictures of those. The one by Dix has a thousand spaces. The one, the, what's called Block Seven, where those artist studios were, have a little over 900 spaces. Uh, the Whole Foods garage has 650 spaces. Um, and then a, a couple of thousand uh, surface spaces as well. So there are some pad sites to the east, more traditional kind of uh, power center, strip mall stuff. Got to have that too. That's part of the balance. You know, it's uh, every store, I always joke, every store can't be, uh, you know, Tattered Cover, um, Whole Foods, and Trader Joe's. It just can't, it just can't be. You've got, you've got to have a little something for everybody to drive traffic for the whole the whole development. What this shows you is kind of what's left to do. Um, to the left, those were those, uh, we had a picture earlier, there's kind of that park there and, and for, for sale and for rent units. There is now a, they have a fancy name for the duplex. Pulte Homes is building uh, on the lot just to the east. They're building uh, a residential development there. Um, already sold several, I understand. Um, There'll be some other activity here on the bottom two lots just uh, east of that park. That area right there will, will be developed someday with probably the same type of residential you see right next door to it, the, pal, the, uh, the lofts. So it continues to be a work in progress. And I think um, one of the most important lessons that, that we've learned through this is the need for flexibility in zoning and, uh, and so forth. So it's great to start out with a master plan. And if you're going to stick to that master plan through hell and high water, you're going to fail. So you have to build in flexibility because markets change. Uh, the economy, God knows, changed in 2008 through 2011. If we had stuck to our original zoning, we wouldn't be as successful as we're going to be, as we are right now, excuse me. 
Um, the thing about mixed use, why it's why it works is that if you think about it, you've got all these different segments. You've got the office segment, you've got the retail segment, you've got the for sale residential segment, the for rent residential segment, commercial, you name it. And each of those has a separate kind of life cycle. So if you're just a retail, i.e. Villa Italia, and the retail cycle goes down, you're dead in the water for a while. But if, if you've got these four or five or six different segments and they each have their individual peaks and valleys, they can last, they can sustain themselves if you've got each of those things working. And that's, you know, that, that is really the power of mixed use development. Now, it, it takes an economy of scale that this 104 acres uh, can help produce, but um, uh, you've, got to, you've got to have, again, that balance, a word I keep using. Uh, I, I think, you know, lessons learned, let me talk about a few of those. You know, one is the lesson we learned um, about putting all your money in one retail pot at Villa Italia. Um, retail is very, very fickle. It's more so now than it was in 1999. There are less and less great operators out there, so you've got to have you've got to have everybody else in the mix, all the other segments in the mix. So, a lesson learned from continuous continuum standpoint, when asked what they would do different, um, the answer I most frequently hear is they would not spend that all of that hundred eighty five million dollars up front they would not build all the structured parking that was a huge investment so continuum was the was the owner um, they have done a lot of refinancing over the years taken strategic opportunities to uh, to uh, lower their interest rates they also have taken on partners they actually have a majority owner partner now um, continuum is no longer the the majority owner. I don't know what their percentage is. It's less than 50, though, just it's under 50. 50 but they're still the managing. They're the on-site manager still. Right. Um, so, yeah, they would not have, again, built the cathedral for Easter Sunday right out of the chute with all of that structured parking. It's extraordinarily expensive. They would have phased it in. Um, have the revenue projections met what they had expected based upon the TIF and the sales tax share back? Um, the answer to that is um, they, because of the economy, they never, they haven't hit the height that they were hoping to. However, they're doing pretty well. So how's that for kind of a mushy answer? When Northern Rack and Target came in and Best Buy, that really helped bolster the um, traffic, the foot traffic in the area. So that's really helped. So. So we continue, we cannot stress enough the importance of the relationship between the public sector and the private sector. We have a fantastic, trusting relationship with continuing partners. We continue, we continue to work on uh, code interpretation. We continue to modify the original, uh, 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 the original development plan, the ODP, to adapt ourselves to current market situations. Um, we, we're, we work with them in, in trying to accommodate some key tenants, whether it's Best Buy, Nordstrom's, or, or a small tenant. Um, we, we just work very, very well with them. You, you absolutely have to. And I'll, I'll close by, by, by making one statement that, that may surprise you a little bit. And it's, it's uh, I think, one of the reasons that, that, that uh, Belmar has been so successful. We did not go into this project to make money. We did not go into this to make money. That was not our goal. We went into this to stop the decay in the, in the core of our community. When a mall starts going south, the prospect of a boarded up mall with a chain link fence around it is truly frightening. We were already seeing um, retail tenants leave in, in areas surrounding Villa Italia. We were seeing declining property values, not just at Villa Italia, but residential and commercial property around that. We simply could not let that continue. If we'd have gone into our original negotiations trying to make a ton of bucks on it, it wouldn't have worked. We knew that if we did it right, we would make money. I mean, that's the real moral of the story. And uh, we do make some money, I don't know, a million or two a year now. And uh, that is on a, as time goes by, going to be on a very steep upslope. We're going to make more and more money. You know, our as it turns out, we had a 20-year plan or 25-year plan of uh, total revenue of perhaps $100 million out of, out of Belmar. 
But boy, you've got to be patient. You've got to find the right partner. Was, it was 48 acres of, of uh, vacant land. Okay, and so talk about how that... Sure, that was uh, actually a similar process. There was a citizens committee. Uh, I happened to be on that committee in, I think, 1998. And, uh, boy, through the years, there had been a ton of proposals there. Um, there was a fancy, you know, city center plan and all these skyscrapers and stuff. That was never to be. Um, there was... Uh, there was, there was a plan for some big box. Wasn't there a vote in the mid-90s? There was. The c citizens voted down some plan that we had, right? Um, so again, creates a, they, they didn't like what we were proposing, so we formed a citizen committee and uh, worked with Opus, um, John Shaw, who some of you probably know. And uh, uh, what you have there now is something called Lakewood City Commons. And there's, you know, a little more traditional retail there. There's a, there's a King Supers, there's a, a Michaels, um, that, that cosmetic store, Ulta, Ulta, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, we made a deal with, with, with Opus that, uh, you know, our city, he, he, we needed a new city hall. We were spread out all over the city. We were renting space here, there, and everywhere. Um, we had 1,000 employees at that time. And uh, they saw the, the market potential of 1,000 a a thousand employees shopping potentially every day. So part of our deal uh, with them building Lakewood City Commons, part of the deal really, again, created by the buy-in of the citizens group, was that um, they built our city hall at cost. And I don't know how many square feet our city hall is, but we, we, moved, it, we moved in... Uh, we built that for, I think, $29 million. We built in, we moved in hard goods, soft goods, construction, computers, you name it, for $207 a square foot in, uh, in 2000. So that was a really good deal for the taxpayers. Um, we, we, we stopped paying hundreds of thousands a year in office rent around the city, and uh, that deal came around, uh, was profitable for the citizens in really a quick amount of time. So that's how that happened. That was controversial, too. And part of that, yeah, good question, thank you. Uh, the cultural center, one of those development principles that the citizens were absolutely strident about was we have to have a cultural center. Arvada has one, for God's sakes. Lakewood <laughs> needs to have one. So I, I listened to those conversations. Um, so, yeah, that's been, that is the focus for arts and culture in the city of Lakewood. Yeah, Mayor, what is your life expectancy for this? We don't we don't have an, an end date. This is the kind of this is what flexibility is all about. This is what adapting to market conditions is all about. It, 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 spreading yourself out in terms of having having all those segments. This is a place where people live. Um, you know, if if you look around, and I don't I don't I don't want to mean to knock anybody, but let me just give you a separate example. Um, look at uh, 29th Street in, in Boulder. Really cool retail development, but nobody lives there. So I think they're more susceptible to the swings in markets because of that. Thank you. Mayor, do you, do you guys see that uh, you've got the north side of the Alameda there, and then the west side of uh, Wadsworth and north of Alameda. I mean, those two other areas there look like they would be ripe for further development with regard to the proximity to the two centers you've got. Or do you guys, have, is your thought process extending now to some of these other properties? Well, here's the good news. The Geico building is coming down. <laughs> Uh, I keep threatening to be the first one with a sledgehammer. <laughs> uh, that's been a long haul. Geico and, and, and uh, Bennigan's coming down. That's been a nasty little corner. Um, you know, there's uh, this is a true story. Uh, uh, Continuum was looking at buying buying much of that center just to the north of them, across the street, and uh, the. Um, 
the owner was out of the country on vacation. Bruce was out, was out of town, and his son-in-law was running things and turned the deal down. Um, the owner was not very happy when he came back into town and heard that story. Uh, so that is still owned by the same folks. Uh, you know, there's been, uh, you, you, you've seen that strip mall on the north side of Alameda be, be redone. You know, they've, they've, they've done some investment because of Belmont. Uh, it's had an incredibly, you know, I talked earlier about stopping the decay. Well, your hope is it's also a catalyst, a seed that's planted, and Belmont has absolutely been that for all of Alameda. Part of it, though, would, would, did, you know, just accessibility, really these things are self-contained, so if you're in the city commons <clears throat> or Belmar, I don't know, you don't really see people walking back and forth. You guys thinking in terms of any ped-friendly kind of things to make it more, make co improve connectivity amongst the... I, I cover my eyes when I watch people cross Wadsworth. It is... <laughs> it is it's not good. It is a state highway, a very busy state of 70-some thousand cars. That's not right. Forty-five thousand cars. Um, we've we've talked about sure. We've talked about a ped bridge. We've talked about a tunnel. You know, just because of public safety and perception and otherwise, a tunnel I don't think would ever work. A, a bridge is something we're never going to be able to afford to build. At some point, maybe there'll be a public-private partnership that would create some sort of pedestrian safe pedestrian crossing. I sure would like to see that. It's not on the drawing board right now, unless. I wasn't in the office today. Anything happened well, today? Not, that wasn't the conversation today. <laughs> <laughs> they do talk about that recently. Yeah. They want to move the head bridge from Southwest Plaza. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 it's more used, but... I don't think anyone will miss it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm not sure how many acres are in here. 104. 104. And uh, what's the connection with these 104 acres with the urban renewal program? It's... It, well, it's an urban renewal project within the urban renewal area of, of uh, Alameda. For the whole 104 acres? Yes. And I assume you have heard me say that the urban renewal is something that would change something that you might have had in your original master plan is going to change. Yeah, and that's, that's where that great relationship is between the public and private sector is absolutely essential. But there's a there's a, a a bond of trust between the two entities that is that you know cannot be overstated. So when they come in and talk to us and, about changing market conditions and, and the need to adapt the ODP, um, hey, they know more about this than we do. We, we respect their opinion, and uh, we work with them as closely as we can. And to that point, it's also important that the staff. The planning staff and all of the employees also understand the importance of being nimble and accommodating um, the vision here. And sometimes that's tough when people have a black and white book, how you do things. And this is different. And that took a real shift, a real cultural shift in our organization. Um, but it worked. So this is not, I mean, Kathy's heard me say this a hundred times. This is not about planners having checklists. This is about planners having vision and being flexible. This is different. And uh, you have to have different standards. With everything you've talked about, and you started with talking about how the Urban Renewal Authority was voted on to be the council. Yep. And now, now closing that loop, what difference did that make in that kind of flexibility in those decisions? Did it make a, a positive impact on your ability to do all that? Absolutely. I mean, I don't have to tell you guys, you, you understand the big picture. Um, you're, you're doing this every week, every day. Um, um, I think ur if it were a separate urban renewal board that convened uh, a couple of times a year, I think it would be more difficult for them to, to, to get the big picture, to understand the continuity, and, and to understand our vision of where we're trying to be uh, 15, 25, or 50 years from now. I think it was a critical decision by the electorate. And I, I didn't really understand how important it was at the time. I do more so now, I think. Talk, it's, a, it's an interesting phrase, and it really sort of has a lot of dimensions to it, but planners having vision, not checklists. The, instilling that kind of a culture in a municipal environment is not you know, without its own challenges. Can you talk a little bit about how you 
worked through that process. I mean, any large organization, you guys had a thousand employees, you know, and I don't know how many were on the planning side of the operation, but but you understand. We all understand. There's a way of doing things. Things get done a certain way. So if you want to go in a different direction, how did you guys approach that issue? Uh, I'll let I'll let Kathy take most of that. You know, I, I spent six years on the planning commission. Planning is something that's that. Um, is, is in my heart. I want planners. I want planners to succeed, but it's, it is a challenge. Man. It, is a it challenge. is a challenge. We have about probably 40 people in our planning yeah. department, and that many are more in the public works department, which both have an important role in this kind of development. And it's really about um, spending time with staff so they understand the vision, so they're a part of. Um, understanding what the vision is for the development, not just what do you need to do and, and here's your job and you take care of this. It's spending the time that you need to to um, let everyone have a chance to look at what this can be at the end. And it, it works very well when you take it step by step and do it slowly and have conversations and have people help each other understand how do we get there? And you tell us, how do we get there? How do we, how do we become nimble? How do we understand the differences and the nuances to this type of development as opposed to some more regular, ordinary development, like a strip mall or something? Um, and it does take time, and you're always going to have that pushback. But if you just keep cultivating that and um, really recognizing the, uh, the ingenuity that they would come up with, it, it worked. And we have a group of employees who are really proud of Belmar. And that, that's really cool, and I'm proud to say that. Even our engineers got it. And they tend, to, and God bless them, but they tend to be pretty black and white. And they understood the importance of the flexibility and the vision of this project. So. Having said that, we have 44 square, more square miles in the city of Lakewood, and lots more development. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it, it's a challenge to have planners sort of be flexible, right? Yeah, it sure is. It really is. Kathy, along those same lines, uh, uh, how does the fire district uh, react to the narrow streets that Belmont has? They were a part of the conversation as well, and, and that's really the secret, is you bring everyone in at the beginning so they understand what their challenges are going to be, and they appreciate this project as well. And West Metro is our fire district. Right. So, it, you know, we've got a good partnership with them. Mayor, one of the things you mentioned is, is uh, continuum was very important as a partner. So maybe you can cover a little bit about how they ended up being chosen, um, who does the recruiting of retailers, uh, and how has that happened, as well as uh, folks that might be separate business owners or business uh, property owners within the, the complex uh, and, and how is how does that work and um, you mentioned a little bit about Victoria's Secrets being on the corner um, knowing there might be some sensitivity to certain retailers versus others that's across the community how did that get dealt with okay um what was the first one? <laughs> uh, the first one is, is recruiting continuum or making they, that decision. They, they, do, they do the recruitment. They, they but, but getting them to begin with, because you said the partner was key. Choice of partner. Did they find you or did you find them? They, we, we kind of found each other through uh, a well-known, um, uh, uh, through Maria Garcia Berry. We actually found, kind of found each other. There was an introduction made back in the late 90s between Mark and, and Mike. That's how it started. Mm -hmm. it, was that, it was really that simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they are very professional. I mean, the first guy that, that, that negotiated, recruited companies and negotiated leases came out of Rockefeller Center or someplace. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah they, they, they recruited some high-powered people. You want to take the... And, and they manage that. So they, they, they do all of that work with their tenants. Um, which is, which is good for us. We also have a really good ongoing relationship with Continuum, um, which is important to know. That's a real lesson learned for us. When you find your developer, it needs to be a person um, uh, or a group that does have that vision, but also is in for the long haul. Um, they're still with us, and as you see, it's only two-thirds done, 
and they've they've changed their model as time has gone on. So he, he's he's a, he's a good guy. And he's a big thinker, and he's made relationships. This is another piece tying this back. He's made significant relationships with our planning staff too to help them understand the vision. Um, but in terms of the leasing and the selection and the placement, that's all their decision. <coughs> Mayor, uh, uh, concerning your comp plan, where, how, how did the comp plan address this redevelopment? Were, were the, did the comp plan have to be changed? Um, no, we, we did. Uh, we, the, the comp plan was written in 1987, and uh, we, we did this under that old comp plan. We had a, have a new one as of 2003. <clears throat> you know, comp plans are not, comp plans are not, they're not blueprints, they're guidelines. So hopefully there's enough flexibility within a comprehensive plan to allow something like this. And again, I keep going back to the fact that this was a real culture change for our community, a real culture change. Going from this, this, this mall where you went in and you got an orange Julius and it was the cat's meow, right, to uh, Victoria's Secret on the corner. I mean, that was a big change. So are we talking rezoning and other things? Yeah, it took a rezoning. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Can I tell? Can I just tell one team? Of course. Story? Thank you. I think this is much. So I had, I had lunch here at Belmar recently, and I ran into a resident who was one of a, a senior woman, an, an older gal who lives here at Belmar, and we talked a little bit. She she said, "Well, I was just at the tea store buying some herbs, and I'm having a little get together later." And I thought, "How sweet! She's having a little tea party with her friends that live in Belmar." <laughs> And I said, are you having a tea party? And she said, oh no, we're infusing vodka and we're having a martini party. <laughs> Good for you. So there, there may be seniors there, but they're happening seniors. That's Jesus. Can I talk about Fessy a little bit? Any more questions on Belmar? Sure. Just one more. So sure. um, you had those apartments that were to the south, and there's a lot of other housing in that immediate area. So what were the positive effects of that housing? Good question. Yeah. Well, first of all, they all changed their name to Belmar or something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Belmar Villas, you name it. Yeah, uh, yeah it's been, and they, they invested some money. It's been very good for them. Not everybody can live in Belmar. There's only 807 units. So it's been uh, you know, a rising tide of result. Well, it's definitely for those, those units you see right there, just to the south. Good question. Come, that's, a, that's another 1,000 people in residency. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want a quick update on Federal Center? Yeah. I'll do real quick. I don't have any visuals. Today, the Federal Center, does, do people, does everybody know where it is? It's on about Union and Six. Um, Union today has approximately 28 restaurants. We debate that. Um, between all the way from paper napkins to linens. Um, and we have about 6,200 employees at the Federal Center today. The new hospital that just celebrated their one year, one year birthday in June brings in about 1,500 employees. Um, so the, we're looking at the property just north, yeah, just north of the hospital. And it's really, this is a story about um, a partnership. So GSA, the federal government, owns about 50 acres adjacent to, right up to Sixth Avenue and right behind the Sheridan. Um, there are about 50 acres there going through the surplus uh, process right now with the federal government. Right below that, um, so to the south, is an RTD parking lot. Right now there's a thousand spaces. It's just a sea of parking that RTD owns, and that's about 14 acres. So we have 50 and about 14. Can you picture where I am? And right in the middle, the rail line's going to do what we call the horseshoe, and the rail line's going to come in and go to this transfer station and then move out and go toward Red Rocks and then to the county seat in Jefferson County. There's also a bus transfer, transfer station there too, so it's a multimodal, or it will be once the rail line opens next spring. Well, what's, what we've been working on diligently is this partnership as it relates to combining the property. That's 50 acres and 15 acres, so it can be um, a, a really quality TOD property, transit oriented development, that really reflects the sentiments of the community that lives there, or the people who've worked there or continue to work there. 
Um, so it's been a challenge, to be honest with you. It's been a challenge um, with these different governmental agencies, one being the federal government, one being RTD, but we're moving along. Um, we're in the process of developing the, the criteria for a master developer. And we want to look for a person or a developer like what we had at Belmar, what we have over at Denver West, um, who, who is visionary and who will be there for the long term because um, we really want this to be a smart development that incorporates uh, tenants of sustainability. And, um, it's, and we recognize that the market isn't going to allow this to be de to develop and built out um, immediately, so it's going to happen and evolve over time. So we really want to find a good developer who can um, help incorporate this vision. So that's about where we are. I talked to GSA today, and yes, it has been deemed as surplus, and then it goes through a whole hierarchy of disposal process, and it takes time. And, and RTD um, has designated this site as one of their four pilot programs. So what we understand being a pilot program really means is they're interested in really making this a good development and being flexible. Flexible. You know, it really doesn't serve anyone to have this huge sea of parking. It makes better sense to go vertical with your parking and to have some shared parking, right, with the with the retail and the office and the residential as well as the trans um, the people who are using the different modes of transportation. So, please. I tell you, I, I use liquid as an example in lots of places because I think you guys did a tremendous job on your zoning around your transit stations, including this one that you were talking about by the hospital. Um, the, it, it's just amazing how the community seems to have bought into what you wanted to do. And it's not anything that's going to happen overnight. It's going to take it 50 years for some of those to redevelop as your zoning, you, your new zoning has, has set it aside to do. But that's future planning, and that's really great. And I use that as an example in lots of and, places. You, know, you really have to manage those expectations so that people don't think it's going to be built overnight, and they understand that. The other thing um, is you really need to take the time and spend that those extra hours meeting with the public and talking to the people who will, who are impacted and who, who live around these areas so that you're really reflecting with these plans what they want to see. So, so yeah, transit mixed use only was a two-year process with the public involved, again, community buy-in. Then we shifted to Colfax and then Colfax mixed use only, two-year yeah. process, yeah. different players, public, public buy-in. Mm -hmm. Gotta have it. Yeah. It's, so, it's painful sometimes. But it's going to pay off. Yeah. You're, uh, yeah, you just, I was actually going to ask you about Colfax. Um, the, the Belmars, the Unions, the Denver Wests have attributes of a lot of land available for doing some creative stuff and very cool stuff. Colfax is sort of an interesting animal because and it's it's got some, we've got some I don't know, issues somewhat similar, where it's a lot more chopped up, it's corridor kind of stuff, you know, the, maybe a Broadway corridor or a little bit of Boulevard or some such things. I mean, it's not obviously exact, but some of these things where you've got a lot of small, mixed-use kind of stuff in there, how are you approaching that, given that it's a different beast, if you will, than, than sort of a Belmar or a Union? It is it is a different piece. Colfax is, um, it's, it's uh, it has drainage problems, it's uh, uh, flood plains, in some cases floodways, that's why ultimately there hasn't been any new development for all these years, because it's, it's, it's too expensive to remediate drainage, to get into the expansion. Um, but obviously light rail is, is, is going to fundamentally change North Lakewood and Colfax for the better. Um, we're already seeing some evidence of it, there's some new projects that have been built and are, and are on the drawing board. Um, but it is smaller, it's more piecemeal, it's one lot, one block at a time. It's not this grand mm -hmm. hundred acre kind of thing, it never, it never will be. It takes a, it takes a lot of patience. And, uh, uh, you guys get involved at that one lot, you bet. Yeah. You know, you bet. So we now have a, a business improvement district where the last meeting section of Copex that didn't have one. Where's that run? Uh, it runs roughly uh, Sims to Sheridan. It's a little spotty in there, but it seems to share it. We also have uh, an arts district. It was really 40 West Arts District, Colfax Highway 40. 
uh, centered around the Rocky Mountain College of Art Design, behind Casa Bonita, everybody knows what Casa Of course. Uh, it was on the track for the Colfax <laughs> Right, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of good things happening, but it's not going to be, you're not going to scrape it and build something in it. It's a, we have the, the wonderful advantage of a, you guys have rail here. So, you know, once in a lifetime, seven hundred million dollar public infrastructure investment here is going to be capital. Uh, on the onesie twosie kinds of things, do you guys go for any sort of quote unquote? You said you have a bid involved. Uh, this is but do you have any sort of tax increment financing or incentives for people to do things? It is, a, it is an urban renewal district. Yes. So you can do some of the same kind of stuff. And indeed, the Walmart at Colfax and Wadsworth is an urban renewal project. And as I always say, try putting the words urban renewal and Walmart in the same sentence <laughs> in the year 2001. It's a challenge, but it worked. Well, thank you all. I know we're, uh, yeah. we're pretty envious of you guys, too. You have a great downtown. Oh, here. gosh, yes. <laughs> We love it. I yeah. came here for your sugar. For your I love this. Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. We know how to get to Kathy's sweet too. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Really.